have you ever experienced a moment in your life that was so painful and confusing that all you wanted to do was learn as much as you could to make sense of it all? When I was 13, a close family friend who's like an uncle to me passed from pancreatic cancer. When the disease hit so close to home, I knew I needed to learn more. So I went online to find answers. And using the internet, I found a variety of statistics on pancreatic cancer. And what I had found shocked me. Over 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late. When someone has less than a 2% chance of survival, why are we so bad at detecting pancreatic cancer? The reason our current modern medicine is a 60-year-old technique, I mean, get real, if I told her than my dad. <laughs> but also, it costs $800 per test and is grossly inaccurate, missing 30% of all pancreatic cancers. Your doctor would have to be ridiculously suspicious that you have the cancer in order to give you this test. Learning this, I was sure there had to be a better way, so I went online, where I find every answer to everything, and I found what an effective sensor for pancreatic cancer would really have to look like. The sensor would have to be inexpensive, rapid, simple, sensitive, selective, and minimally invasive. And there's been a reason why we haven't updated this test in over six decades. And that's because when we're looking for cancers, we're looking for certain proteins in your bloodstream that are found at these elevated levels when you have the cancer. And this sounds really straightforward, but it's anything but. Because the problem is that you already have liters and liters of blood in your system that are already abundant in these proteins. And so it's almost as hard as finding a, like a needle in a stack of nearly identical needles. However, Undeterred due to my teenage optimism, I went to any teenager's best friends for knowledge, Google, Wikipedia, how I get through every high school quiz. And I found a database on pancreatic cancer protein, 8,000 of them. And I was like, wow, that, that's quite a lot. I didn't even know you had that many proteins, but apparently you do. So um, I just began going through that, and I was just like, I'm going to look at every single protein. It's kind of like this video game I play, like Pokemon. Gotta catch them all. Gotta find all the proteins. So I went through, and on the 4,000th try, when I was close to losing my sanity, I felt like one of those people that just like, gets addicted to a TV show and like, never leaves. I'm just like, eating ice cream, looking through these proteins. And I finally found one, and it's called mesotheon. And it's just your ordinary run-of-the-mill type protein, unless you have pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer. In which case, it's found at these very high levels in your bloodstream. But also, the key is that it's found in the earliest stages of the disease when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. So now that I found a, lot, a reliable protein to detect pancreatic cancer, I then shifted my focus to actually detecting that protein and thus the presence of these cancers. And my breakthrough came in the most unexpected of places, high school biology class, the stifler of innovation, especially in my case. So I'd stuck in an article on what are called single-walled carbon nanotubes. Ooh, there they are. And there are these long, thin pipes of carbon that are an atom thick and 150,000th the diameter of your hair. So they're extremely small, but they have these incredible properties. They're kind of like the superheroes of material science. Like, they're stronger than steel. They conduct electricity better than copper. They're just amazing. And then I was, we were supposed to be learning about these things called antibodies. And I had luckily skipped ahead in my textbook and read about them the night before. So I wasn't really paying attention. However, like out of one ear, I was like, hmm, oh, antibodies. So we were learning about these. <laughs> and essentially, they're molecules. You can imagine them like a lock and key. They only react with one specific protein. And in this case, it would be a cancer biomarker. So then I was thinking, hmm, maybe I can combine these two things I'm reading about. One, antibodies, and two, my carbon nanotubes. And what I got was, essentially, you weave in these networks of, um, you weave in antibodies into networks of carbon nanotubes, and then you'd have a network that only reacts with one specific protein. In this case, um, the antibody, or the protein that's found when you have pancreatic cancer. So then I was thinking, hmm, what would change in this network? And actually, one of the amazing properties about these carbon nanotubes is when you spread them apart, they actually change their electrical properties. It's hard for electricity to flow through a network of these nanotubes. So then, my network would only change its electrical properties when there's this one protein present. In other words, detecting pancreatic cancer. However, this is just like those sketchy car deal ads. You, there's always a catch. And the catch is, is that these networks of nanotubes are extremely flimsy. And you need to really support them. So I chose to use paper, obviously. 
And so I was just like, hmm, what can I do here? And what you do is it's kind of like making chocolate chip cookies. It's really simple, and I love chocolate chip cookies. So you essentially start with some water, you pour in the nanotubes, pour in some antibodies, mix it up, you take some paper, dip it, dry it, and then you can detect cancer. So, <laughs> however, all of a sudden I realize that I need a lab probably to do this. I mean, my mom, she had put up with a lot of stuff. Like, I'd made, I'd made explosives in my basement with my brother. She wasn't too pleased about that, but she's like, oh, that's kind of pushing it. And I made, like, E. coli where we make sandwiches. She's like, oh, that, that's pressing it. And so I'm like, cancer research, that doesn't really mix with the home environment. So I'm going to need a lab. So then, of course, I was just like, I'm going to write up a procedure, materials list, and I'm going to email anyone that has anything to do with pancreatic cancer. So I do that. I essentially find 200 people, 200 people at Johns Hopkins University and the National Institutes of Health that have anything to do with pancreatic cancer whatsoever. I kind of felt like one of those Facebook stalkers, like, ooh, where are your interests? Pancreatic cancer? Ooh. But, <laughs> but um, essentially what happened is I typed up a procedure, a materials list, and a timeline, and I sent it to these 200 professors. And essentially, I expected to sit back and essentially have these positive emails pour in. They'd be like, you're a genius. Oh my god, come to my lab. And I get to pick and choose. And then reality took hold. I got 199 no's. Some of those professors, I realized, weren't nearly as nice as their profile pictures made them. Like, they were smiling. <laughs> but no, they, they were really mean. Like, they would go through my procedure, and they would, like, ax apart, they were like, oh, this is so stupid, what were you thinking? And like, th they were really nasty in some of those emails. But um, eventually one person said yes, Dr. Andrew by my age, and he said, oh, maybe, I, I might be able to help you, kid. And so I'm just like, oh my god, thank goodness. My, I was like bouncing off the walls, I was just like, I'm going to be amazing for this guy, I'm going to go into this interview and knock it down. So I bring like these giant blue ring binders full of papers, 500 plus journal articles I'd read, and I come in, I slam them down on his desk, not like the best introductory thing to do. However, I sit down and he starts, he peers over this giant stack and he's like, hmm, so tell me about your project. So I start talking and then all of a sudden he like stops me and looks out the window or the door and he says, hey, you, PhD student, get in here. So he actually had a name I forgot though, but. <laughs> He calls this PhD student in, and then he sees another few, and he's like, you get in here. And like, he's collecting these PhD students. Finally, there are 20 PhD students, plus me and the professor jammed to this tiny room that's like probably smaller than the stage. So we got really cozy with each other. Like it was kind of like a clown car in there. And they're just like interrogating me, trying to sync my procedure. However, I had come prepared. I prepared for all those questions, and so, Eventually, I got through it. I guessed on a ton of those questions. I was like, um, so what is, what is the past metacarpal part of this one protein? I'm like, um, of course this. And so I essentially just guessed on like half those questions. I guess see always, like I do on my SATs. And I got through it, and I got the lab space that I needed. And then I began working, and I realized my once brilliant procedure had something like a million holes in it. I was like, hmm, maybe that's why the professor was like, what are you talking about? But um, I got through it, and seven months later, I'd patched each and every one of those holes, eventually ending up with one small paper sensor that costs three cents, and it takes five minutes to run. This makes it over 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than our current methods of detection. But also, what's so cool about is that it can detect the cancer in the earliest stage, when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. But also, so far in tests, it is 100% accuracy. So in the next two to five years, this patent-pending sensor could potentially lift the once dismal pancreatic cancer survival rate from 5.5% to close to 100%, and it would do similar for ovarian and lung cancer. But it wouldn't stop there. By shifting out this one antibody, you can detect an entirely different protein. So you could detect proteins for Alzheimer's, HIV AIDS, heart disease, other forms of cancer, really any disease in the entire world. And so through this, I faced a lot of adversity. For example, one of the main adversities was that when I was looking for a paper, I would find a paper and all of a sudden it would ask me for $35, and that's called a paywall. And I ran into a lot of these. And the one unfortunate thing about buying these research papers to get my background knowledge is the fact that once you buy that paper, you can't return it. I, like, I'm just $35 out. I can't just be like, oh, this, this paper is useless. 
could, could you give me back my money? No, it doesn't work that way. And so that's one of the main adversities for a lot of scientists nowadays. In fact, Harvard University just published something, a memento, that essentially stated major periodical subscriptions, especially to electronic journals, published by historically key providers cannot be sustained. Continuing these subscriptions on their current footing is financially untenable. When the wealthiest university can't afford to buy the background knowledge for its research, what does that say about our academic dissemination of this knowledge? These, publish, these publishing houses, there are, are 24,000 of these different articles out there. However, and you might think free market will take over, the best models will come out, and we'll be able to have these cheapened prices, and it will be great. But no, it's a false diversity. There are only three major publishing houses in the entire world, each controlling 7,000 different journal titles. And in addition, they control 50% of the best science. And so they can, they've commoditized the most valuable resource in the world, scientific knowledge. And so what we must do now is somehow claim this back from them. And how we should do that is through open source technology to democratize the ability to innovate to everyone, such as people like me and people like you. So through this, I've learned a very important lesson. That theories can, through the internet, theories can be shared, and you don't have to be a professor with multiple degrees to have your ideas valued. You can be a 15-year-old kid like me. Regardless of your age, your gender, your ethnicity, how much money you make, it doesn't matter. It's just your ideas that count. So instead of Instagramming pictures of your food you, on Facebook, and you can instead be changing the world. So if a 15-year-old who didn't quite know what a pancreas was <laughs> could find a new way to detect pancreatic cancer, just imagine what you could do. Thank you. <laughs>